Indonesia calls on its army to crush student protesters. John Howard flies out for an APEC meeting in Malaysia. And the stars gather in Melbourne for the concert of the century. Good evening. Indonesia's President BJ Habibi has ordered the army to crush anti-government demonstrations in Jakarta. As student protesters clashed with security forces for a sixth day, looters smashed their way into dozens of shops. Indonesia's year of living dangerously shows no sign of ending. Once again, students filled the streets of Jakarta demanding political reform. Elsewhere, looters took advantage of the chaos and ransacked shops. Outnumbered, troops were powerless to stop them, firing shots in the air. It was a stark contrast to yesterday, when the army opened fire on unarmed demonstrators, killing 13. Today, thousands gathered to mourn their dead, this funeral for an 18-year-old science student who'd been protesting peacefully. The week of demonstrations is now degenerating into mass unrest, the worst violence since May, when riots forced President Suharto to resign after 32 years of authoritarian rule. The students accuse his successor, President Habibi, of stalling on political reforms. They're demanding his resignation. Instead, he's now ordered troops to crush them. The people taking action, he said, are doing so unlawfully and against the interests of the country. But the threat of more violence hasn't stopped the protesters. They prayed in front of troops and tried to convert them, at times successfully. The students say they won't back down until the government embraces democracy. Meanwhile, Australians are being warned to stay out of Jakarta. Matthew Clark, 7 Nightly News. A new flashpoint is developing in neighbouring Malaysia as Prime Minister Howard flew out for an APEC conference in Kuala Lumpur. Malaysia's Prime Minister tried to play down the growing crisis. What began as a peaceful march through the capital quickly deteriorated. Demonstrators wrestled with plainclothes police who infiltrated the group and began firing shots over the crowd. Protesters are demanding an end to Prime Minister Mahathir's 17-year rule and the release of his sack deputy, Anwar Ibrahim, now on trial for corruption and sodomy, charges which he's denied. The rallies are a huge embarrassment for Dr Mahathir, preparing to host the Asia-Pacific Economic Summit in Kuala Lumpur. And while many world leaders have refused to meet Mahathir over the Anwar situation, the Australian government is proud to stand alone and says it will tackle the controversial issue head on. We have a right to call these things as we see it and uh, that will be our bold approach. Mahathir skirting the issue. We want to forget about the political part of it. That can be discussed in other forums. But uh, APEC is a forum for economic cooperation. US President Bill Clinton's cancelled his trip to monitor the Iraq situation, a move supported by Prime Minister John Howard. Clearly they are related to what is happening in Iraq and the President's decision is entirely understandable. Elise Mooney, 7 Nightly News. A standoff in the Gulf tonight, just moments before warplanes were to start bombing Baghdad. Iraq finally surrendered to US demands. The United Nations Security Council will continue urgent meetings tomorrow to decide their response. Saddam Hussein was just 30 minutes away from feeling the full power and fury of the United States. Their B-52 bombers were airborne. Their ships had Baghdad targeted. When this letter arrived at United Nations headquarters, the leadership of Iraq has decided to resume work with the UN weapons inspectors. The attack, Operation Desert Thunder, went on hold. We were poised to take military action and we remain poised to take military action. Iraq's 11th hour move may not be enough. The US describes it as unacceptable and from Australia's Richard Butler. It's for the Security Council to judge uh, what it means and where we go next. In Baghdad, this wasn't a humiliating surrender. It was cause for celebration as the international community sent Saddam yet another warning. There can be no negotiation, no further deals, no more amendments to what they have agreed. The build-up of that massive US armada in the Gulf continues. More attack jets left American shores, mid-air refueling en route. Still, aid agencies are already arranging to go back into Iraq. That would make any US attack difficult. Yet again, Saddam Hussein 
frustrating the West. Chris Reason, Seven Nightly News. 75,000 people have been given a time to remember at the MCG. More than 50 artists belted out the music at a concert commemorating 25 years of the Mushroom Music label and after 10 hours, a surprise ending. Looking over the bridge to the MCG. It was the sort of show unseen in Australia since the Sunbury Rock Festivals of the 70s. And the lineup spanned the generation gap with the greatest of ease. Kelly, Kylie, then everyone from Denny. To Thorpey. Most people. To Barnsey. Then the finale, Jimmy Barnes joining in excess to remember an absent friend. And I was lucky enough to record this song with this band, with Michael. I wish Michael was here. Sally Young, 7 Nightly News. The Sydney Ferry Service is to get a $100 million upgrade. The project includes a fleet of supercats and a facelift for existing ferries. Travelling on our harbour is about to take a space age turn. The state government says the ferry of the future, the Supercat, is safer, quicker and quieter. It will bring Sydney ferries into the next century. Existing jet cats and first fleet ferries will be sold and replaced by a dozen Supercats. The ultra modern ferries use a seventh of the fuel, are propeller driven and will cut travel time by a third. The 12 new Supercats will take a year each to build. The first should be up and running by the end of next year and then one every 12 months after that. It'll give us an extra capacity during the Olympics, but, but this is really done for the people of Sydney for the long term. The $100 million plan includes a major facelift of the four Manly ferries, a sprucing up of the wharves and new security cameras. But the state opposition says it's too little too late and we can't afford it no delivery before the election. It certainly begs the question, where's the money coming from? Premier Carr says $10 million a year over a decade is affordable. These are, these are perfectly designed. I wish I could get one with a design like this for the office. And he's promising fares on the Supercats won't cost passengers any extra. Monique Wright, Seven Nightly News. All the local stories from around the region are coming up next, then later in sport, the V8s take to Mount Panorama in the great race at Bathurst. A horrific single vehicle accident near Tamworth early this morning has claimed the life of a teenage girl. Another three people are recovering in hospital. The accident happened at about 5.30 this morning on a tight bend around two kilometres from the New England Highway on Tinton Hole Road. It would appear that uh, a vehicle uh, came into a 45 uh, kilometre per hour corner and obviously lost control and collided with a tree. Trapping the female driver and a backseat passenger and killing a third person. A young male was able to scramble free of the wreckage. He's being treated for suspected spinal injuries. My next door neighbours and I often said that it's only a matter of time before someone gets killed. In the four years that he's lived near the corner, Mick Rutledge has seen them come and go. I grabbed some first aid uh, stuff we have in the house and uh, came down there, but um, there wasn't really much we could do. And I, I believe that they should have uh, Armco or something here to, to flick people away from the trees. Investigations into the cause of this morning's accident are continuing. Police would not confirm whether alcohol was involved. Wheat farmers have been hit with yet another fungal disease normally found in Western Australia. Better known as glum blotch, the disease has been found in almost every wheat belt in New South Wales, adding to the woes of farmers. It's a plant disease that thrives in wet conditions and warm winters. Normally found in Western Australia, Septoria nodorum, better known as gloom blotch, has been found in most wheat belts in New South Wales, adding to the growing list of diseases farmers have had to cope with. This is very unusual to actually see it damaging crops in, uh, in New South Wales. Uh, the, uh, the crop, one crop in particular I've seen will be uh, 
obviously uh, having quite severe yield loss as a result of it. While it hasn't been a major problem around the Moree area, agronomists aren't ruling out the possibility that it could be here. However, a similar fungal disease has been identified in this part of the state, easily mistaken for the gloom blotch. Um, it, it's sort of called melanism and it's associated with the stem rust resistance gene, uh, SR2. And when you get warm, wet conditions during flowering, you end up, it's a side effect of the resistance gene, you end up with uh, browny, purpley blotches on the heads. Burning stubble is a recommended control measure for the disease or crop rotation. Experts are urging farmers around the Moree area to leave burning off until at least March rather than straight after harvest to ensure best results. Amanda Frame in Moree, Prime Local News. Gold and silver medal Paralympian Cameron de Berg has delivered an inspirational address in Warrialda. Cameron lost a leg in a motorbike accident in New Zealand. Cameron de Berg's visit to Warrialda is part of the Road Accidents Authority road safety tour. At 16, he was hit by a car as he was doing a U-turn on his trail bike. He told students at Warrialda High School about the horrors of the days following his accident. I basically had this leg in traction, had pins through it in four different spots with weights hanging off it. This leg was broken. I was uh, in traction. I had tubes coming out of every exit in my body. The next day, his right leg was amputated above the knee. A keen sportsman, Cameron took up swimming. He's just returned from the World Swimming Championships in New Zealand, where he won two silver, a bronze and a team's gold. The biggest buzz of my life was going to Atlanta to represent Australia there. With the, it was just huge walking out into, a, um, into the grounds where there's 120,000 spectators. Cameron trains in Brisbane and going on his current form will be well in medal contention at the Sydney Paralympic Games in 2000. David Evans, Prime Local News. The Tamworth Triathlon Club has staged its first race for the year. Mick Russ and Alison Paul taking the honours this morning. With the first race postponed earlier this month due to rain, perfect conditions greeted 65 competitors for today's triathlon at Tamworth City Pool. Hope Bruce leading the women's wave out of the water. A number in the men's field had made the trip to Foster for the half Ironman, leaving the race wide open. Tim Hillard establishing a break on the swim leg. He was quickly overhauled as Gunnar's Kane Miller took the lead on the bike, going into the final run with a handy lead. But 40-year-old Mick Russ was entering his favourite discipline and the four-kilometre run suited him down to the ground, racing away to win by one and a half minutes from Martin Patterson and Kane Millard. Yeah, I'm racing all right. I've done two or three short races. That helps in today's race. A few of the blokes are still getting a bit fit and young Jawayne Cabin, he punched it, so that helped me a bit more in the race today. Alison Paul also used her favoured run leg to advantage, winning comfortably from Hope Bruce and Donna Hickey. Um, yeah, it's actually quite impressive to run because I've been doing a lot of run training, mainly long, I like, prefer the longer distance, I don't like these sprint races. Scott Beveridge, Prime Local News. Highlights from the Australian Women's Golf Open up after the break in national sport and Greg Norman back to his best in the Shark Shootout. Sport now with Scott Beveridge and the Australian Open has gone across the Tasman, Scotty. Certainly has, Fiona. Never really looked in danger. Kiwi Marnie Maguire has led from start to finish to win the Australian Women's Golf Open in Melbourne. Maguire shot a 6-under-67 final round to end four strokes clear of American playing partner Kelly Robbins. World number two Kari Webb finished at 3-under. Jan Stevenson even for the tournament. With short iron in hand, Marnie Maguire has been deadly all week. Handling the pressure in her stride, she attacked the flag without fear or failure, picking up four shots on the first six holes. Oh. Curry Webb's chances ended early, her putting woes worsening, needing three goes at it on the first green. Kelly Robbins fell four shots behind Maguire, but three consecutive par fives produced three consecutive birdies. Yeah, yes. And all of a sudden, the pair was square at nine under on the turn. Nicole Lowen wasn't laughing, going bunker to bunker on 15 for a double bogey. The diminutive New Zealander continued to eat away at what became a match play battle for the Open title. One up at 10 under after 12. She's back in the lead. Defending champion Jane Crafter wrapped up the battle for third, finishing with a string of four birdies. Fantastic. 
while Maguire edged three shots clear by the last before setting up her seventh birdie of the day and finally finding a smile. Well, this will be my sixth win. I've, I've actually never won outside of um, Japan, so this is exciting that now that I've won on another continent and I've been being a New Zealander, winning the Australian Open, obviously, it's just wonderful. Mark Doran, Seven Nightly News. Greg Norman is in striking distance of the lead in his own shootout. The Shark and partner Steve Elkington just one stroke behind leaders Davis Love and Brad Faxon. With one round to go, Faxon and Love hold the, the edge over the 12-team field. The also one stroke back is Fuzzy Zeller. He looks to have done his homework on the Thousand Oaks course. Partner John Daly played good golf but still carries the weight. The focus is all on Norman, looking good after his seven-month layoff and a real chance to win the shootout for the first time. This bunker shot at the 12th, one of the best of the round. The V8 Bathurst crown has passed from Holden to Ford, with young guns Stephen Richards and Jason Bright winning today's FAI 1000. They held out the Commodore of Larry Perkins and Russell Ingall. Stephen's dad, Jim, and Jason Barguana were third in another Holden. The V8s were ready to take on the mountain. The Mark Scaife Craig Louds Holden leading the onslaught. The menu Mazera campaign barely got out of neutral, ending lap one. Greg Murphy looking good until he ran into steering problems and never recovered. At the two and a half hour mark, carnage on the mountain. Oh, look at this! No! Goodness me! Massive accident on top of the mountain! The Scaife Louds combination living at the front, but defending champ Larry Perkins was lurking. That first Bathurst crown still eluding Glenn Seaton as he and teammate Neil Crofton ran into problems. Tony Longhurst had a close shave in the pits, but nothing's ever certain at Bathurst. Scaife quickly finding that out. Loud seeing their Bathurst dream slip away, the Jason Bryant Steve Richards team moving to the front with Brad Jones in pursuit. The Palmer production car came off second best with the barrier. Seen the pace car out for a third time. The Jones Larkham car went into the pits and disaster. The car stopped dead and struggled to start. When it did, Jones could see the race gone. The scene now set for a cracker finish. Bright leading, followed by a Perkins battle with Jason Barguana. The young gun, Bright and Richards, stunning the mountain. Stephen Richards and Jason Bright win the FAI 1000 Classic. Bernard Cohen. Seven nightly news. The Blues have bounced back onto the winners list and Mark Taylor is back scoring runs. New South Wales cruised to a seven wicket win over South Australia today in the one day are in Adelaide. Taylor and Bevan, the top scorers. A great start by the Blues, soured by an attack of the fumble. Skipper Mark Taylor guilty, so too Corey Richards. Oh, he's dropped it. Can you believe that? As Greg Blewett looked to lift the run rate, Michael Slater showed how it's done. Straight to mid off. Well, Darren Lehman's debut as one day captain was short lived, oh, out yes, for a duck, a and when Gavin Robertson chanced his arm, the Redbacks were reeling at four for 51. He's gone, is it? Oh, what a bit of fielding that was. Jeff Parker and Tim Nielsen made a bold Hit rescue that. attempt, that but the home side were all out for 172. He's gone. Taylor and Slater made a confident start to the run chase before a mix-up saw Slater on his way for 20. Richards fell to a screamer of a catch by Brad Young. Oh, what a good catch. Beautifully taken. But Taylor and Michael Bevan recovered, the skipper reaching his half-century before Mark Harrity made the breakthrough. But the visitors had the match sewn up, Bevan scoring the winning runs. Lisa Dalton, 7 Nightly News. England are heading for a morale-boosting win over Queensland in Cairns. The locals faltered in their second dig after Adam Dale had claimed seven scalps in England's first innings. England are chasing a target of 142, but its stumps were five for 74. The Wallabies face a tough test tonight when they take on France A in their first tour game. Wallaby skipper John Eels has the lowdown. This tour has already struck a chord with the locals. A visit to a French blind school to honour the memory of Louis Braille. But we're immediately down to business. The French see us as number two in the world, and we see France as the best Europe has to offer. After warming the bench for most of the year, Nathan Gray will slot into the centres. One of a number of changes injury has forced upon us. So I suppose we're going to have to play our way into, into form, get our... Uh, combinations working well together and then hopefully we'll be able to uh, see if we can experiment maybe with a few new ideas. Conditions are totally different here rather than in Caloundra, but the team is determined to perform straight up after a six-week break. 
Phil Kearns is one of the team hoping to repeat an earlier performance in Lille. But yeah, scored a try, my first test try in Lille back in uh, 89, um, my third test I think it was, and uh, whilst uh, we lost the game and doesn't hold fond memories for most, I, I guess there's one good memory for me. French were impressive in their 34-14 test win over Argentina and will obviously be strong opponents for us in the test next week. John Eels in Lille, Seven Nightly News. Yeah, the Wallabies should be far too good. Fiona. Thanks, Scotty. All, right. All the weekend weather details coming up after the break and Sydney comes to a standstill for the great duck race. Once again, those showers sticking around on the coast are mostly fine but cloudy day over inland districts. A top of 23 degrees at Armadale, 24 at Glen Innes, Gunnedah and Moree among the warmest, Tamworth 27 after 13 overnight. Newcastle made it to 25 degrees today, Lismore to 27, Coffs Harbour slightly cooler, Port Macquarie 25, 17 to 26 the range at Taree. Those showers and thunderstorms are associated with a cold front moving in from the west. There's a high developing in the Bight region, it'll move through Victoria. Victoria tomorrow, directing a southeast airstream over much of New South Wales, with a few showers extending northwards about the coast and adjacent ranges during the day, clearing from the south coast. Looking ahead now, the forecasts for the northwest slopes and plains, fine mild to warm tomorrow, light to moderate south to southeasterly winds. For the northern tablelands, a few showers, a milder day tomorrow. For the hunter, again, a few showers in the east, again milder. And for the mid north coast, a few showers, winds tending milder, fresh southwest, southeasterly. For the northern rivers, some isolated showers developing and a mild day ahead. Tomorrow's temperatures are Medal 23 degrees, 27 apiece for Inverell and Moree, Tamworth 12 to 25. Newcastle 22, 26 the top tomorrow for Lismore, Port Macquarie 24, Grafton 19 tonight, 27 tomorrow. For the far north coastal waters, winds from the south southeast at 10 to 15 knots. For the mid north coast, again, winds from the south southeast at 10 to 15 knots. And for the Hunter, winds from the south southeast at 10 to 15 knots, seas 1 to 1.5 and metres. The high tide tomorrow at 7.25 a.m., 1.5 metres, the low of 0.5 of a metre at 1.41 in the afternoon. And finally tonight, a good day to get quacking on the water in Sydney for a good cause. 25,000 plastic ducks were entered in this year's great duck race. They got their starters orders at Roseville Bridge, then it was up to time and tide. Sponsors paid $5 for each duck. The money raised from today's race will go to support Special Olympics Australia and the Sunnyfield Association, who help people with intellectual disabilities. And that's all from Prime Local News Team tonight. I'll be back again with updates a little later. Until then, good night.